the Book of Change stated, Families who perform kind deeds will accumulate fortune which can outlast many generations. Therefore, in order to change a bad life into a good life, we not only have to reform our faults, but also have to practice all forms of kindness and build upon our virtue. Only in this way can we rid ourselves of the karma created in the past. Once our kind practices accumulate, our bad life will naturally turn into a good life. Thus, the practice of changing destiny can be proven. Once there was a family by the name of Yen. Before they agreed to give their daughter in marriage to the man who later became Confucius' father, they looked into the past deeds of the family. After finding the family to be one that practiced kindness and accumulated virtues, the Yen family felt assured that their daughter would be marrying into a family that would be prosperous with outstanding descendants. Sure enough, their daughter later gave birth to Confucius. Confucius had once praised Xun, an emperor of early China, on his filial piety, saying, Due to his great filial piety, Shun and his ancestors will be known and respected by others. His offspring will be prominent for many, many generations. These sayings were later proven true throughout history. Now I will prove to you in these true stories that merits can be attained through performing kind deeds. In Fukien province, there was a prominent man named Rong Yang who held a position in the imperial court as the emperor's teacher. His ancestors were boat people who made a living by helping people cross the river. Once there was a storm which lasted so long that fierce flooding washed away all the people's houses. People, animals and goods were carried down river by the current. Other boaters took advantage of the situation and strove to collect the floating goods. Only Rong Yang's grandfather and great-grandfather took interest in rescuing the drowning people. They did not take any of the goods that floated by. The other boaters all laughed and thought them to be very stupid. Later on, when Rong Yang's father was born, the Yang family gradually became wealthy. One day, a Taoist priest came to the Yang family and said, your ancestors have accumulated a lot of merit. Your offspring should enjoy wealth and prominence. There is a special place where you can build your ancestral tomb. So they followed the Taoist suggestion. Shortly after, Rong Yang was born. Rong Yang passed the imperial examination when he was only 20 years old and later received imperial appointments. The emperor even bestowed his grandfather and great-grandfather with the same imperial honors. His descendants are still very prominent today. So says a proverb, a sense of pity is present in everybody's heart. Zicheng Yang from Chekiang province is another example. Zicheng worked as a member of the clerical staff of the county courthouse. He was a kind, humane and law-abiding man. Once, the county magistrate punished a criminal by beating him until he fell, and his blood spilled out onto the ground. Beat him! Ah, I've been wrong, Your Honor. I've been wrong. Ah, Beat him again. Ah, please. I've been wrong, Beat him. Your Honor. I didn't Beat him. Ah, 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 ah. Beat, beat, beat. Ah, I've been wrong, Your Honor. You cunning fellow. Very daring. Ah, Beat him. Ah, ah, I've been wrong, Your Honor. Beat him again! Beat him again! Beat! Beat him! Beat! Your Honor, please remain calm. Please stop beating him. It's all right for you to bleed. But how can I not be angry when this person has broken the law? Your Honor, when even those in government positions of prestige and power are corrupted and do not follow the righteous path, 
How can one expect the common people to abide by the laws? Thus, in a case like this, we should be more understanding. Although Zi Cheng came from a very poor family, he never took any bribes. If the prisoners were short of food, he would always take food from his own home, even if it meant going hungry himself. This practice of compassion never ceased, and eventually Zi Cheng had two sons who both became very prominent and held important government positions. Even the descendants of the Yang family remained prominent for a long time as well. So says a proverb, loving all living things is a virtue of heaven. Here is another true story that happened during the Ming dynasty. Once an organization of bandits appeared in Fujian province. The emperor appointed General Xie to lead the imperial army to pacify them. General Xie wanted to make sure that the innocent people were not accidentally killed in the hunt for bandits. So, he managed to obtain a list of those who belonged to the organization and commanded that a white flag be given secretly to those who did not belong to the bandits. They were told to place the flag on their door when the imperial army came to town and the soldiers were ordered not to harm the innocent. With this one thought of kindness, General Xie saved nearly 10,000 people from being killed. Later, his son placed first on the imperial exams and he later became the prime minister. His grandson also placed highly on the exams. His whole family thus attained high positions and great wealth. Another legend happened to the Lin family from Putian County in Fukian province. <laughs> Take this one outside. Hi. Don't worry, everybody. Everybody, you will get a share. Uh, don't worry. Everybody will get Take a share. Some. Some. Don't scramble. Yes, this one for yeah. you. Take this some. one for you. Over yeah. here. Take it's some. Carefully. Yes, this don't one for drop you. it. Yes. Yeah. Hold properly. Uh, don't drop it. Don't, don't drop it. Take some for yourself. Yeah. Come yes. again next time. All right. Take over. Yes. Take some. Okay. Yes. Take Goodbye. carefully. Yeah, this one for you. This is for you. Yeah. And, and this one for you. Take, take another one. Come, come. Among their ancestors was an old lady who was very generous. Every day, rain or shine, she would make steamed buns to be given to the poor. There was a Taoist priest who came every day for three years and each time would ask for six or seven steamed buns. The old lady always granted his request and she never expressed any displeasure. Don't scramble, don't scramble. All of you will have your share. Come. <laughs> Madam Lin? You are... I have eaten your steam buns for three years. Perhaps I can show my gratitude this way. On the land behind your house, there is a good place to build the ancestral grave. And if you're placed there in the future, the number of your descendants who will have imperial appointments will equal the number of seats in a litter of sesame seeds. Really? Oh, thank you for your kind guidance. Don't mention. Since you're sincere in helping people, you should receive good retribution. <laughs> That's a blessing. when the old lady passed away. The Lin family followed the Taoist suggestion and buried her at the designated place. The first generation after that, 
nine men received imperial appointments. From here we can see that one's charitable deeds and accumulated merits will really benefit one's descendants. A proverb says, one who is pure-hearted will be respected by both gods and ghosts. There was an imperial secretary from Taizhou by the name of Ta Zhu Ying. When he was young, he used to study in remote mountain areas, and he had the following encounter. forcing her to remarry. <laughs> but she is defying their order because she wants to preserve her chastity. <laughs> That's right. Tomorrow night she's going to commit suicide by hanging herself here. And will replace me so that I can be reborn again. <laughs> Congratulations! Tonight let me celebrate with you first. <laughs> <laughs> no, I must try to save the woman. In order to save the woman, Mr. Ying immediately set out to sell his parcel of land on the following day. He obtained four liangs of silver and made up a letter from the daughter-in-law's husband and sent it to her home along with the silver. The parents-in-law, they noticed that the letter was not in their son's handwriting. But upon examining the silver, they found that the silver was indeed genuine. And as such, they did not insist on forcing their daughter-in-law to remarry. Therefore, the daughter-in-law did not commit suicide and her husband returned home eventually. And it was a happy union. Well done! Mr. Ying not only saved the woman, but also her marriage. It's really a good deal. Mm. Later, Mr. Ying heard the ghosts speaking to each other again. Hmm. Originally, I was able to leave this place for rebirth, but my chance got messed up by Mr. Yip. Why don't you inflict some harm on him? No, I can't. His goodness and virtue has been recognized by the Supreme God, hmm. and he's going to receive a prominent position in the future. How can I harm him? Hmm. After hearing this, Mr. Ying became even more diligent in practicing kindness and accumulating merit. Whenever there was a famine, he would use his own money to buy food for the poor and the needy. And he was always eager to help those in emergencies. When things did not go his way, he always reflected within himself rather than complain of the outside world. Even today, his descendants are still very prominent. Another example is Kung Si Tu, who lived in Chaxing County, Chekiang Province. Mr. Tu used to work in the courthouse and would spend nights in the prison cells talking with the inmates. 
Whenever he found anyone to be innocent, he would write a classified report to the judge informing him of innocent cases. The judge would then question the prisoners accordingly and clear the case. Through Mr. Tu's efforts, more than 10 innocent people were released, and all of them were extremely grateful to him. Soon after, Mr. Tu also made a report to the emperor recommending that investigators be sent to check the prisons for innocent people every five years and that the sentences could be reduced or cancelled in order to prevent the innocent from remaining in prison. The emperor agreed to Mr. Tu's suggestion and he was chosen as one of the special agents in charge of reducing sentences for those who might be innocent. One night, Mr. Tu dreamed of a deity who told him, you are not supposed to deserve a son in this life, but this act of reducing prison sentences for innocent people is in line with the wishes of heaven. You will be bestowed with three sons, and they will all attain high positions. Soon after that, his wife gave birth to three healthy sons, Ying Xun, Ying Kun, Ying Chin, who all became senior government officials. Another example of attaining good outcomes from practicing kindness is someone who is a distant family of our Yuan clan. Is it so? Who is he then? He is Ping Bao, who lived in Chiaxing. Ping was the youngest of the seven sons of the magistrate of Qizhou, Anhui province. He was sought into marriage by the Yuan family at Pinghu County. Ping Bao was very knowledgeable and talented, but he was never able to pass the exams. Once, while traveling on one of his many journeys to Lake Liu, he was caught in very heavy rain. Here you are, Master. I don't have the heart to allow the statue of Guanyin Bodhisattva to be defaced by the rain and dust. Uh, uh, could you use these ten liangs of silver to have the temple repaired? Oh, I'm sorry. Repairing the temple involves a big project and your silver is insufficient for this purpose, so I'm afraid that it is very difficult to fulfill your wish. Master, don't give any more. This is a whole family belongings. <sighs> As long as the statue of Kuan Yin Bodhisattva remains undamaged, I don't care if I have to go without clothes. Abbot, please take my humble offering. Amitabha, to give up money and clothing isn't a difficult deed to accomplish, but your deep sincerity is truly rare and precious to encounter. Amitabha, please don't mention it. I have to make a move now. Thank you. After the temple was repaired, Ping Bao led his father over to visit and spend the night there as well. That night, Ping dreamed of the Dharma protector of the temple who had come to thank him, saying to him that since he had accumulated these merits and virtues, his children and descendants would enjoy having imperial appointments for generations. Later on, his son 
and grandson both passed high examinations and were appointed as senior imperial officers. TNT. There is real goodness and false goodness. Honest goodness and crooked goodness. Hidden goodness and visible goodness. Seeming goodness and unseeming goodness. Improper goodness and proper goodness. Half goodness and full goodness. Big goodness and small goodness. And finally, difficult goodness and easy goodness. These different types of goodness each have their own reason, which should be carefully learned and understood. If we practice kind deeds, but do not learn the way to differentiate between right and wrong, we may end up doing harm instead of good. Now, I will explain the different types of goodness one by one. Once upon a time in the Yuan dynasty, a group of scholars went to pay homage to eminent monk master Zhong Feng, who was advisor to the emperor on Tianmu mountain. Master, Buddhist teachings often speak of the retributions for good and evil. They say it's like the shadow following the body wherever it goes. This is saying that doing good will always have its rewards, and doing evil will always have its punishments. Then why is it that there are people who practice kind deeds, but their families and descendants are not prosperous and successful? On the other hand, there are evil and wicked people who do bad things, but their families and descendants do quite well. Is there no fairness in Buddha's teachings? Hmm. Ordinary people are blinded by worldly views. They have not cleansed their minds of impurities and cannot see with true perception. Therefore, they look upon true goodness as evil and mistaken true evil as goodness. This is very common nowadays. Furthermore, these people do not blame themselves for bad perception on their part, but instead blame the heavens for their misfortunes. Master, goodness is goodness and evil is evil. How can they be mistaken for each other? <laughs> Could uh, each of you express your opinions on what is good and what is evil? Master, to yell at and beat others is evil. To respect and treat others well is good. Hmm, well, not necessarily. Being greedy for wealth and taking another's money is evil. Not being greedy and abiding by proper way is good. Not necessarily. So, what is really considered good and what is really considered evil? To do things with the intention of bringing benefit to others is good. To do things for the sake of oneself is evil. If what you do is for the sake of benefiting another, then it does not matter if you yell at him or beat him. That is still considered good. If your intention is for self-benefit, then regardless of your appearance of respect and courtesy, it is still considered evil. Therefore. When one practices kind deeds with the sole intention of benefiting others, this is considered as benefiting the public. And if it's public, then it is real goodness. If you only think for yourself when doing kind acts, then what is considered private benefit, and that is false goodness. When kindness springs from within the heart, it is real goodness. When one does good just for the sake of doing a good deed, then it is false. Also, when one does good without expecting anything in return, it is considered real goodness.
When one practices kind deeds for some other purpose than to benefit others, it is false. These differences should all be scrutinized by those who wish to practice true kindness. What is honest goodness and crooked goodness? Hmm. People nowadays often look upon a conservative and nice person as a good and kind person. However, the ancient sages and saints have shown that they prefer those who are courageous and hold high goals for themselves. Those who appear to be conservative and careful in their everyday actions may be liked by all people, but because of their weak personality, they easily go along with everything and they are unable to think for themselves. From this, we can see that the viewpoint of common folk greatly differs from that of the sages whose view is similar to that of the heaven, earth, gods and spirits. Therefore, those who wish to accumulate merit should practice with a true and humble heart, not for the purpose of pleasing others. Honest goodness comes from the thought to help all others. And crooked goodness arises from the thought of greed in wishing only to please people. Therefore, if you wish to help all people, that is honest goodness. But if it is because of greed you please people, it is crooked goodness. Father, what is hidden goodness and visible goodness? When one does something good and people know about it, it is called visible goodness. When one does something good and no one knows about it, it is called hidden virtue. Those with hidden virtues will naturally be known by the heavens and will be rewarded. Those who practice visible goodness are known by people and they enjoy fame. Fame itself is a fortune but fame is not favoured by heaven and earth. For heaven and earth do not like those who seek fame. We can see that those who have great fame but lack the virtues supporting it, they will eventually encounter some kind of unthinkable adversity. A person who truly has not done any wrong but continues to be falsely accused by others will have descendants who will suddenly become very prosperous and very very successful but then why is there a saying that what seems to be goodness but is actually not in the spring autumn period there was a country named Lu because there were other countries which took their citizens as slaves, the country of Lu made a law which rewarded those who paid the ransom to regain the freedom of their fellow citizens. At that time, Confucius had a student named Zi Gong, who did not accept the reward, although he paid for the ransom to free his people. But when Confucius heard this, he scolded Zi Gong, saying, you have acted wrongly in this matter. When saints and sages undertake anything, they strive to improve the social behavior, teaching people to be good and decent. One should not do something just because one feels like it in order to gain vanity fame. On hearing this, Zigong became puzzled and looked at Confucius with a frown. Confucius then explained to him, saying, In the country of Lu, the poor outnumber the wealthy. By refusing the reward, you lead others to think that accepting the reward money is being greedy. Thus, all the poor people who do not wish to appear greedy will hesitate to pay ransom in the future. Only very rich people will have a chance to practice this deed. If this happens, no one will pay ransom to free our people again. Another student of Confucius, Zi Lu, 
once saw a man drowning in the river, and he went forth to rescue him. Later, the man thanked him by giving him a cow as a token of gratitude. Zilu accepted his gift. Confucius was happy when he heard this and said, in the future, people will be willing and eager to help those who are drowning in deep waters or river. If we look at these two examples from the view of common people, Zi Gong, who did not accept the reward money, was good, and Zi Lu, who accepted the cow, was not as good. Who would have known that Confucius praised Zi Lu instead and scolded Zi Gong? From this, we can see that those who practiced kind deeds must not only look at the present outcome, but should also consider effects of the act in the long run. One should not only consider one's own gain and losses, but should look to see the impact made on the public. What we do right now may be good, but with passing years it may inflict harm upon others. Therefore, what seems like goodness may in fact be the opposite, and what appears to be the opposite of goodness may someday turn out to be goodness done after all. Father, what is improper goodness and proper goodness? In the Ming Dynasty, there was once a Prime Minister named Wen Yi Liu, who when growing old retired to his hometown where he was loved and respected by all. Once, a drunken villager proceeded to insult him. Mr. Liu thought that since he was drunk, he would not want to bother about the latter. A year later, the same man committed a grave crime and was sent to jail with the death sentence. Upon hearing this, Mr. Liu said with great remorse, if I had taken him to the authorities for punishment that day when he came to insult me, perhaps this would not have happened. A little discipline then could have prevented the great harm done now and might have saved him from certain death. This is an example of doing something bad while having good intentions. There is also an example of those who did good when they in fact intended otherwise. Once a famine ravished the land and people stole food from others in broad daylight. A rich family reported their stolen losses from the marketplace to the authorities, but the government did not want to get involved and did nothing to stop the people. Eventually, the people grew more daring and chaos was imminent. So the rich took the law into their own hands and proceeded to catch and punish those who stole from them. In this way, peace returned to the land and the people stole no more from one another. It was with selfish intentions that the rich family acted, but the result of their deeds actually did everyone a great benefit. For we all know that goodness is proper and evil is improper. But remember that there are cases where deeds done out of good intentions result in evil and deeds done with evil intentions result in good. Father, what is half goodness and full goodness? In the I Ching it is said, when a person does not accumulate kind deeds, he or she will not attain good fortune. When one does not accumulate evil deeds, he or she will not bring about great adversity. If we are diligent in doing kind deeds, it is like collecting things in a container. And with diligence, it will soon be full. If we are somewhat lazy in our collecting, then the container will be half filled. This is one explanation of half goodness and full goodness. Once upon a time, there was a poor lady this lady went to visit a Buddhist temple and wished to make a donation. However, she was so poor that she had only two cents, so she gave these to the monk.
To her surprise, the temple's abbot himself came forth to help her repent for past offences and dedicate her merits in front of the Buddha. The lady was very touched by his move. Later on, the same lady was chosen to enter the imperial palace and she became a concubine to the emperor. Clad in her riches, the lady once again went to the temple to donate, this time bringing thousands of silver pieces to give. To her dismay, the abbot only sent his disciple to help her dedicate her merits. The lady did not understand and so she questioned the abbot. Master, in the past I only gave hands in donation and you helped me repent. Today I donate in great sum and you will not help me perform my dedication. Amitabha, the money you gave in the past was scant. It came from a true and sincere heart and it was necessary for me to repay your sincerity by personally performing your dedications. Today, Although your donation is much more, the heart of giving is not quite as true and sincere as before. Thus, it is enough that my disciple performs your dedications for you. This is an example of how thousands of silver pieces are only considered as half goodness and two cents as full. Do you understand? Mm. Another example is of Li Jung, an immortal of the Han dynasty. He was teaching his student Dong Bing Liu the art of transforming iron into gold. They would use this gold to help the poor. Dong Bing asked his teacher, will the gold ever change back to iron again? Li Jung then answered him saying, after 500 years it will return to its original form. Dong Bing then shook his head saying, In this case, I don't want to learn this art. It will harm those who, who possess the gold 500 years from now. Li Jung then smiled and said, To become an immortal, one must complete 3,000 virtuous deeds. What you have just said came from a truly kind heart. Your 3,000 deeds are fulfilled. When we perform a kind deed, it is best if we can do it out of our innermost sincerity. Not seeking rewards or noting in our minds how much we have done. If we practice thus, then all our good deeds will reach fulfillment and success. If instead we always think of the deeds we we have performed looking for a reward of some kind. Then, no matter how diligently we practice in an entire lifetime, the deeds will still be considered half goodness. For example, when we donate money to the poor, we can practice what is called pure donation. In this type of giving, we do not linger on the thought of I who is giving or dwell on the importance of the object I am giving away or think of who the receiver is. We are simply giving and it is out of true sincerity and respect. When we give with pure donation, then one do of rice can bring boundless fortune and the merit from giving one cent can wipe away the transgressions of a thousand eons. If we always keep in mind the good we have done and expect rewards for our actions, then even a donation of thousands of liang of gold would still be considered half goodness. In that case, how can we define big goodness and small goodness? Hmm. Once there was a high-ranking official named Jung Dawei 
who was led into the spirit world to be judged for his good and bad deeds. Don't be alarmed. I have summoned you to the spirit world to let you know about your past good deeds. Can the judge bring out his records of good and evil deeds? Yes, your majesty. Your majesty, I'm younger than 40 years of age. How could I have attained such a bad record? When you have a single thought that is improper, it is considered a bad offense there and then. It does not have to be carried out through action to be counted as wrong. For example, when you see a pretty lady and give rise to improper thoughts, that is an offense. Weigh his scroll of good and evil deeds. Yes, Your Majesty. Hmm. Your Majesty, his scroll of good deeds is heavier than that of his evil Surprise, deeds. Surprise! That my scroll of good deeds is heavier than that of my evil deeds. I can't really recall what major good deeds I've done. Have you really forgotten about it? Once the Emperor planned to build a great stone bridge, you opposed the project due to the hardship it would cause the thousands of people needed for the work. <laughs> well... This is a copy of your proposal to the Emperor. I did make that proposal, but the Emperor dismissed it. How can it bear so much weight against my numerous offenses? Although the Emperor did not take your suggestion, that one thought of kindness you bore for the tens and thousands of people was very great. If the Emperor had listened to you, then the good performed would be even greater. Take him away. Yes, Your Majesty. Therefore, when one is determined to do good for the benefit of all people, then a small deed can reap great merits. If one thinks only about benefiting oneself, then even if many deeds of kindness are performed, the merit would still be small. What is difficult and easy goodness? The knowledgeable scholars of the past used to say, when one wishes to conquer one's greed and desires, one should start with the most difficult to overcome. We should practice like the old teacher Mr. Su of Changxi, who gave two years' worth of salary to a poor man to pay for the fine to the government. Thus he saved the man and his wife from being torn apart, should the husband be taken to prison. Another example is Mr. Zhang from Hebei, who saw an extremely poor man who had to mortgage his wife and child and had no money for their redemption. If he was unable to pay for their return, the mother and child could both lose their lives. Yet another example is Mr. Jin from Chenqiang, Changsu province. He was old and without any sons, so his neighbor offered their young daughter in marriage to him to give him descendants to carry on his lineage. But Mr. Jin could not bear to ruin the otherwise bright and long future of this young girl, and so refused the offer and sent her back home. This is another example of being able to overcome what is most difficult to conquer in oneself. Therefore, the heavens showered down fortune, which was especially good for these three old men. It is easier to accumulate merit and virtue for those who have money and power than for those who are poor. But if one refuses to cultivate kindness, even when it is easy and one has the chance to do so, then it would truly be a shame. For those who are poor and without prestige, doing kind things for others is a great difficulty. But if in this difficulty one can still manage to help others, then it is a great virtue and the merits gained would be boundless. In being a moral person and dealing with affairs, we should help others whenever the opportunity presents itself. You should know that helping others is not such an easy task and that there are many ways to do it. 
In short, the ways of helping others can be simplified into ten important categories. Father, what are these ten categories? Go and get ready the brush and ink before you take them down. Mm. Well, I'm ready, Father. Hmm. All right. The first is supporting the practice of kindness. When we see the people trying to do a little kindness, we should assist them in their deeds and help their kindness grow. When we see others who wish to do good but cannot accomplish it on their own, we should lend a hand and help them succeed. This is the way we can cultivate supporting the practice of kindness. The second category is harboring love and respect. We should harbor respect towards those who are more knowledgeable, older, or of higher status than we are. For those who are younger, less fortunate, or of lower status, we should harbor a mind of loving care. The third category is helping others succeed. When we see a person who is considering whether or not to do a good deed, we should persuade him to put all his efforts into doing it. When others meet with difficulties in practicing kindness, we should help think of ways to overcome the difficulty and guide them to success. We must not be jealous at the accomplishments of others nor try to sabotage their good acts. The fourth category is persuading others to practice kindness. When we meet a person who is doing evil, we should tell him that doing evil will only result in great suffering and painful retribution and that he must avoid doing evil at all costs. We should tell people who refuse to practice kindness or are only willing to practice a little kindness that doing kind deeds will definitely have its rewards and that kindness not only has to be cultivated but must be cultivated constantly and on a large scale. The fifth category is helping those in desperate need. Most people tend to give when there is no need to give and refuse to give when there is really a need. When we meet people who are in great difficulties, emergencies or dangers, we should lend them a hand and help in whatever way we can to bring them out of their difficult times. The merits accrued from helping others in times of desperate needs are boundless indeed. However, one should not become proud and conceited for doing such deeds. The sixth category is developing public projects for the greater benefit of the people. Projects which will bring great benefit to the public usually have to be performed by those with great influence and power. If a person has this capacity, such as rebuilding the water system or assisting a disaster area, then he ought to do it for the benefit of the general public. The seventh category is giving through donation. People of this world love, seek and even die for money. Who is actually willing to help others by giving their own money away? When we recognize the difficulty involved in donation, we can come to appreciate the rarity of the man who is willing to give for the purpose of helping others in need. He is an even greater man in the eyes of the poor. The eighth category is protecting the proper teachings. This is referring to the teachings of different religions. We must be able to differentiate between proper religions and deviant religions. Teachings with proper wisdom and views, such as that of Buddhism, which promotes kindness and goodness in society, should be supported. If one happens to see others in the act of destroying such proper teachings, one must put forth a complete effort to protect and uphold these teachings. The ninth category is respecting our elders. 
Anyone who is deeply learned, knowledgeable, has high prestige or is older than us is considered to be an elder and should be highly regarded and respected. The tenth category is loving and cherishing all living things. We should feel sympathy for all living creatures, even the tiny ants which know of suffering and are afraid to die. How can we kill and eat beings and not feel the least sorry? There are countless good deeds which I am unable to mention here one by one. Let it be sufficient for me to say that you will be able to accumulate many merits if you deliberate on the above ten categories of helping others. it was stated, the law of heaven takes from those who are arrogant and benefits those who are humble. The same holds true in the law of earth. The humble shall be replenished just as flowing water filling up lower places on the ground as it passes by to make up the differences. The law of spirits and gods bring harm to those who are arrogant and fortune to those who are humble. Even the laws of men despise the arrogant and love the humble. Therefore, heaven, the earth, the spirits, gods and people, they all prefer humility over arrogance. The Chinese Book of History has also said, a person's arrogance will bring him harm and his humbleness will bring him benefit. I often went to take exams accompanied by others and every time I would meet scholars who were very poor. I noticed that before they succeeded in passing the exams and became prosperous, their faces showed such humility, peace and harmony that I felt I could almost hold that quality in my hands. Several years ago, I took my imperial exam in Peking. Among the ten applicants from my village, Ching Yuding was the youngest and extremely humble. I told one of the applicants that this young man would definitely pass the exam this year. He then asked me how I could tell. I said that only those who are humble were qualified to receive fortune. Sure enough, when the test results came out, Ching Yu Ding passed the exam. Kai Chi Feng from Chikyang, Kuang Yuan Chao and Jian Shu Hia from Shantong only managed to pass their imperial exams after they carried themselves in a humble way, which was an immense change from their proud and arrogant ways in the past when they failed in their exams several times in succession. However, there was a scholar named Wei Yan Chang from Jiangying who was very learned and wrote good essays. He was very well known among many scholars. One year he took his exam and when the test results were posted, he found that he had not passed the exam. Hey, you!
Huh. The examiner must be blind. I am so talented and am a master in writing poems and essays. How could he have failed me? This is such an injustice. <laughs> What are you laughing at? I'm laughing at your ignorance. The apparent reason for your failure in exam is that your essay must not be good. How do you know it's not good when you haven't even read it? The most important element in writing good essays is peace and harmony. Your angry accusation just now clearly shows that your mind is not at peace and your temperament is violent. How could you possibly write good essays? Uh, 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 what should I do? Whether you pass or not depends on your fate. If you are destined not to pass, then no matter how good your paper is, you will still fail the exam. You yourself will have to make the few changes. How can I change it if it's predestined? Through the power to form your destiny lies in the heavens. The right to recreate it is in yourself. As long as you are willing to do kind deeds and cultivate hidden virtues, there is nothing you ask that you will not receive. I'm only a poor scholar. What good deeds can I possibly do? Practicing kind deeds and accumulating hidden virtues all stem from the heart. As long as you constantly harbor the intent to practice kindness and accumulate virtues, your merits are infinite and boundless. Take the virtue of humility, for example. It does not cost anything. Why can't you be humble and reflect on your own essay instead of blaming the examiner for being unfair? Wei Yan Chang listened to the Taoist monk and from then on suppressed his arrogant ways. He became very mindful of his own actions and tried not to make mistakes. Every day he put forth additional effort to do more good deeds and accumulate more merits. Three years later he dreamed one night that he entered a very tall house and saw a booklet that contained all the names of the candidates who passed the exam that year. He saw many blank lines. Unable to understand what it meant, he asked the person next to him, What is this? The person replied, This is the booklet that contains all the names of the candidates who passed the exam this year. Wei Yan asked, Why does it have so many blank lines? The person answered, The spirits of the underworld check on the candidates every three years. Only the names of those who practice kind deeds and do not make mistakes are allowed to appear in this booklet. The blank lines used to bear the names of those who are supposed to pass the exam, but due to their recent offenses, their names have been erased. If for the past three years you have been very careful and have exerted such self-control that you haven't made any mistakes, then you would be able to fill this blank. I hope you will cherish this opportunity and take care not to make any mistakes. Sure enough, Wei Yan passed the exam that year and placed 105. From the examples, from the examples given above, we know that spirits and gods are always watching our behavior from above. Therefore, we must immediately do whatever is beneficial to others and avoid doing whatever is violent, dangerous and harmful to others. These are all things we can decide for ourselves. As, as long as we harbor good intentions, and refrain from evil doings, don't offend the heaven, and earth, spirits and gods humble ourselves be tolerant and not arrogant then the heaven earth spirits and gods will constantly have pity on us only then will we have a foundation for our future prosperity those those who are full of conceit are definitely not destined to be great men. Even if they prosper, they will not be able to enjoy their fortune for long. Intelligent people would definitely not make themselves small and narrow-minded and refuse the fortune they are entitled to. 
Besides, those who are humble always increase their opportunities to learn. If a person is not humble, who would want to teach him? Also, humble people are always willing to learn the strengths of others. When others perform good deeds, the humble person will learn and follow their examples. In this way, the kind deeds humble people accomplish are boundless. For those who wish to cultivate and improve upon their virtues, they especially cannot do without the virtue of humility. The ancients had an old saying, those who have their hearts set on attaining success and fame will surely attain success and fame. Those who have their hearts set on attaining wealth and position will surely attain wealth and position. A person who has great and far-reaching goals is like a tree having roots. A tree with roots will eventually sprout into branches, flowers and leaves. A person who has set down great and far-reaching goals must humble himself in every thought and try to relieve another's burden, even if the occurrence is as insignificant as a speck of dust. If you can reach this level of humility, you will naturally touch the hearts of heaven and earth. Furthermore, we are the creators of our own prosperity. If we truly want to create it, we certainly will succeed. Look at the candidates who sought for fame and wealth. In the beginning, they did not harbor a sincere heart. It was only a passing notion. When they fancied it, they sought it. When their interest dropped, they stopped. Mencius once told Emperor Xuan Chi, Your Highness has a love for music but your love for music is only a personal pleasure. If you can expand from the heart which seeks after personal happiness to that of sharing happiness with all your subjects and make them just as happy as you are, then surely the nation is bound to prosper. I think it is the same for those who are seeking to pass the imperial exams. If a person can expand upon the heart which seeks to pass the exams, to that of diligently doing kind deeds and accumulating merits, putting forth his best efforts to improve his character, then both destiny and prosperity are his to create. Tianqi, do you understand now? Yes, I do, Father. Liao Fan Yuan did many kind deeds and accumulated merits throughout his lifetime. He had also written four short essays to advise his son. These are none other than Liao Fan's four lessons, which have become popular in the world. Liao Fan was a great philanthropist who had changed his destiny through active accumulation of merits. He died at the age of 74, an increase of more than 20 years over his life expectancy. The book Liao Fan's Four Lessons teaches people how to recognize the truth of destiny, understand the standards of goodness and evil, learn the ways of becoming good people and the effectiveness of charity and being humble. Mr. Liao Fan Yuan also spoke through his personal experiences of changing destiny. This book is enlightening and gives us enormous confidence and courage after we've read it. If we can emulate his examples and put them to practice, our educational and professional careers, as well as family life, will be enhanced. It will also be a matter of time before we reach the stage of becoming a sage. <laughs>